so my company, Enchlo, has been running remote execution services for, for a lot of uh, companies out there. Um, and, you know, despite the, the best effort that the team is putting into it, right, despite the unit tests, integration tests, uh, load tests, code reviews, design reviews, and so on and so on, sometimes mistakes happen. And I want to jump right in. But before we go there, let's take a look at the architecture that we have. So on the left-hand side, we have a client. This could be Bazel, it could be another build system. Um, and the client makes calls to the, to the API servers, and, and typically these run in the cloud. Um, it, they don't have to, but in our case, they mostly do. Um, and so the API servers serve the remote execution API. Um, among other things, there are also a bunch of other APIs that we have on our servers, uh, but this is the one I focus on for this talk. Um, and then the API servers manage a potentially large number of workers. Uh, and we also, use, we also use storage. The reason that we use storage is that storage is actually cheaper than disk. So if you care about cost, then this is an important you know, architectural point. Um, now, what's the remote execution API look like? So it, you can upload files, you can download files, and you can run actions. Uh, there are lots of bits and pieces uh, on top of that, but that's sort of the main thing that you need to know for this talk. So back in 2021, we had an incident where uh, a customer reported to us that their builds were hanging. So they started to build, and at some point, the build just didn't make any progress. Um, and then Pager went off, and we started to investigate. And we looked into it, and we found that two of the workers weren't responding to our PC calls. So what did we do? Well, we restarted the workers, and the, the cluster went back to working. Done, right? Wrong. This is when the work starts, right? It doesn't end with the mitigation. It starts with the postmortem. So what is a postmortem? Postmortem is a technical a technical postmortem, I should say, is a structured review after an incident, right? We've mitigated the incident, it's no longer happening, the, 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 you know, the customer is happy, uh, and we need to assess the impact. What, what actually, you know, how bad is it? Um, and so in this case, it, it fortunately, you know, it was a fairly small cluster. There were 200 developers using this, and they were not able to build for about 20 minutes until we restarted the, those workers, and it was fine. Now, the next part of the postmortem is to analyze why it happened, right? This is, this is one of the most important parts of the postmortem. Um, so let's get, go back to the, to, to the architecture uh, overview. And there's a bit that I didn't talk about earlier, which, which, which was true at the time that this happened, which is that for some RPC calls, the workers were making outgoing calls to other workers, and those workers in some cases, made outgoing calls to yet again other workers. Now, I see some of you smiling, uh, so maybe you know already what the problem is. Uh, each worker only has one outgoing HTTP2 connection, and each HTTP2 connection has a limited number of streams. So if you have two workers that make calls to each other, and then they try to make calls to each other again, and if this happened, happens often enough in a short enough time interval, uh, then you can end up in a deadlock because the workers run out of streams. All right, we've got the root cause. Now let's go on to the last part of the postmodern, which is actionable resolutions. Now, there, like, we were already like looking at this code and we're like, yeah, this doesn't look so good. We have workers making calls to other workers and like it keeps going. That's not too. Not too nice, uh, but at the time that we had the incident, we, we didn't realize that this could actually lead to a deadlock, right? And our takeaway here is that there was actually a design flaw in our software at the time where you really have to ensure that the call graph between your services is acyclic, right? As soon as you introduce cycles and have things that can talk to each other, you can start running out of these connections, right? Regardless of what it is, right? It doesn't have to be HTTP2. Maybe you have an HTTP connection pool. Maybe you have another protocol. But most of the time, you have a limited number of outgoing calls that you can make concurrently, and that can lead to this problem. Now, we also said, you know, at this point, you, you really should have a timeout on all the RPC calls that you're making. Um, 
But there is a caveat here, which is the remote execution protocol has some long-running calls. For example, when you run an action that can take, like, could take an hour, right? Um, and so, it, you know, what's your timeout in this case? Well, if you set an hour, then you still have an hour deadlock, and your, your cluster is unavailable, right? So that timeouts aren't a, aren't a full solution, but they certainly would have helped in this case. So when we talk about these postmortems, there are like different types of root causes, and the one that I focus on in this first postmortem is like the technical failure. There was a bug in the code, there was a design flaw, right? We can fix it, we can mitigate it. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you, the fix to, for, to a problem is so expensive that you'd rather have a detection and then page someone, and that someone comes in and, and goes and you know does whatever is necessary to get it back to work. Um, but most of the time, you want to fix it, or you know, sometimes you have an API that is difficult to use correctly, and you want to refactor the API. Or in this case, you, you have to change the design to make it more resilient to these types of failures. All right, so that was our first postmortem, and I sort of interleaved that with what is a postmortem and how does it work. So the second one is going to be a little bit faster uh, because we can just go through the steps, right? So this happened in 2020. Um, our API servers just crashed occasionally. Uh, memory usage was going fine, and then suddenly it goes up to about 100% and the server's gone, and we don't get any more data points. Um, so on the impact side, fortunately, uh, the client retries the call typically, uh, and if, as long as only one server dies at a time and not too many at the same time, uh, the client will just continue and may not even notice it, right? So in this case, we were lucky in that none of our customers noticed this was happening. Uh, and why did this happen? The reason for this was flow control. So I said earlier, we have these RPC calls between the machines, right? Um, and so let's say there is a very large file that the client tries to download. Like, you know, it could be a 10 gigabyte file, like someone's building a large Docker image, sure. Uh, and now the, the API server has to get the file from somewhere. Look, could be storage, could be a worker. Um, now the, the API server and the worker are on the same network, in the same availability zone in the cloud, so the network is super fast. But sometimes the client, like in this case Bazel, is on a slow network and it's very slow to download the file. Now what happens, you get the data in very quickly, but where does it go? And so the library we're using, uh, the RPC library we're using, is designed to take the data and allocate memory. And at some point, it runs out of memory, and then it crashes, right? And so the key here is we have flow controls on both of these calls, but you're in the middle, in the API server, you have to connect the outgoing flow control to the incoming flow control. Otherwise, some bad things can happen. <laughs> All right, so we implemented flow control. Like, that's easy. <laughs> There is another action item here, which is, well, if you, you know, if you think about it, every time you proxy a long-running call, you have to think about flow control. But that's not an action item. That's not something you can do immediately. That's something you have to do like at some point in the future. And so I talked about types of root causes, right? We have technical failures. But to some extent, this isn't a technical failure. This is a process failure. Right? We want to make sure that as part of, say, uh, a design review process, we want to look at flow control. Right? So part of our templates for design review could have like, a line somewhere, does this need flow control? Just to make sure that in the future, any time we add a long-running like, proxy call to the service, we think about flow control. All right, next up. Number three, uh, slow GOMA builds. This happened in, to us in 2022. Um, and the fun thing about this was it was intermittent. So customer said, hey, I have a slow build. OK, we, we, you know, we're taking a look. Customer says, no, it's fine now. Oh, I have a slow build. Oh, no, it's fine now. Uh, OK, how are you supposed to, like, what are you supposed to do here? Uh, uh, and it actually took us 15 days to, to fix this. It, fortunately, it was just one customer. And one of the properties of Goma is 
it's very happy to fall back to local execution. Uh, there is also a Bezos flag for that, but it's disabled by default, fortunately. Um, and so this wasn't a build failure. So it, there wasn't, it, it's not really like an outage, but you know, if it's slow, then it might as well be, you know, if it's sufficiently slow, it might as well be an outage. So why is this? Okay, we're going back to the architecture diagram. And now at the time, we were running Goma servers. So Goma is a remote execution system, but it has its own protocol. Um, and we had to run the Goma servers as another level of proxies to, to change from the Goma protocol to the remote execution protocol. So let's look at the actual root causes. So one root cause was we were, at the time, 2022, uh, we were rolling out a new autoscaler, and the autoscaler was scaling down very aggressively, right? We want the autoscaler to scale down somewhat aggressively so that the machines don't stick around and we have to pay for them. But at this point, unfortunately, autoscaler was so aggressive, it was scaling down even while there was load and queuing in the system. And what happens in that case is that then everything queues up even more. And now on top of that, the autoscaler also scaled up very slowly. So any time it scaled down, it created like multiple minutes of queue uh, and you know very high queue lengths. So this caused builds to be slow, but only like in, in these spikes, right? It would scale up, it would be fine for a few minutes, it would scale down, and then it would be really slow for a few minutes, then it would scale up again. The second problem, and this could happen to you too, is that by accident, we, so we, we, we patched Goma server, of course. Uh, this was an Entropy specific patch that's not upstream, right? So if you were running Goma, you wouldn't be affected by this. Um, but we accidentally, we had a large refactoring of some of the front end code of the Goma server, and we accidentally put in some logging code that was logging giant log messages. And the, the log messages were so large that the Goma instances were actually at 100% CPU. <laughs> now, this wasn't immediately apparent because our logging pipeline was actually dropping very large log messages. So we look at the logs and everything looks fine, but the machines are like constantly churning, trying to get the logs out and it's not working. Okay, so. Just a note, we shut down Goma in early 2024 when Google broke all of Goma at once. Um, that's a separate postmodern, which I'm not going to talk about today. And we're now running our eClient, which is sort of a Goma replacement that can talk the remote execution API directly, uh, so Goma is no longer involved. So again, coming back to this slide, like there is technical failures here, but there's also process failures here. And in this case, I want to focus on the process failures that we had. So we were running a third-party software that we didn't fully understand, that we didn't have very good monitoring for, we didn't know exactly what to monitor, the monitoring was very noisy, and people started to ignore the alerts, right? This is what you do not want to happen to you because this is really bad. Um, and the second issue, second sort of process issue was it was unclear for the customer how to page us, how to raise an incident, right? So the customer was seeing slow builds, and at some point the customer was getting fed up and sending us angry messages, but wasn't actually paging us, wasn't actually creating an incident. And so when you finally created an incident after 15 days, we put together a team of our best Goma experts, and we actually managed to solve the issues in a few hours. Right? If we'd done that earlier, it wouldn't have been ongoing for 15 days. So, I mean, on the technical side, like the action items are obvious, like we need to fix this thing, uh, right? Revert the logging change and revert the autoscaler rollout. Um, but then on the, on the process side, it's really important to clearly communicate how to raise an incident or how to escalate an issue, right? And as part of this, we implemented a number of changes to our process to make sure that our customers know exactly, you know, this is a chat, this is not an, you know, we don't consider this an incident. If you want to page us, this is the address where you can page us. And we also changed how we work, right? When someone asks a question in Slack, you know, or whatever in chat, um, 
right? And we think, oh, this looks bad, then we ask, is this an incident? How many people are affected? You know, are you able to do work? And then we will internally raise an incident, even if the customer didn't. Right? And even if you run a remote execution service at, at a company which has established proto, you know, protocols, right? most companies you know, at, at, at the scale that we're talking about uh, have processes to handle these kind of things. Um, but even then, it's still important to, to, to understand that you need to do this communication clearly. But, but it's certainly even even bigger issue if you, if you work across companies with a vendor or you know, with a subcontractor or whatever. And then, of course, the other takeaway here is whenever you want to, to host third-party software, you really need to spend some time up front, well, I think at least, you need to spend some time up front to understand the software and to figure out the right monitoring and to understand the behavior. Right? In both cases, if you're not doing it up front, it just means that you have to pay the price later. All right, the fourth and last incident for today. Um, we, had a, we had a high QH. So one of our customers reported that one of the pools, so we have, sorry, I didn't show that in the system diagram, but we can have multiple pools of different machine types. Um, and so the customer reported that one of the pools is fully utilized and it's queuing. It's queuing a lot, right? This is a QH, and the reason that it's, that it's uh, horizontal is that we actually have a limit, an internal limit on the QH. After an hour, we start rejecting work from the queue. Um, the impact that was that we had slow builds for, for two hours. Uh, this one customer had. Um, so looking at the root cause analysis, we're now going away from, from the system architecture and towards a different kind of thing that we used uh, to, to, to analyze our, our software and to de describe the behavior of the software. This is a, sort of a timing diagram. Time goes from top to bottom where we can see the client is sending a, a request, in this case like an action, a, a request to run an action on the remote execution server to the API server, and then the API server, is, if the pool is fully loaded, if there's no capacity, it will queue it. Uh, and then eventually, when capacity becomes available, that request gets handed to the worker, and then eventually the worker hands back the result to the API server. So what happened here was that one client, one single build, sent 172,000 compiled actions to the server, and because of an error in the source code, the compiled actions were actually timing out, right? Um, so from our, so, 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 so try to put yourself into our shoes, right? From our perspective, there is a client sending work to the cluster and everything is, you know, everything is behaving correctly. The cluster is taking the work, it's queuing it, right? And eventually it will finish the work. Um, but at the same time, there is a problem here, right? Why is this one build allowed to put that much load on, on, onto the cluster? Um, and so from our side, what we want to do here is we want to put in guardrails uh, to prevent this from happening, right? Well, one obvious thing is to reduce the timeout. Like these were 10 minutes. We don't expect them to run 10, in, 10 minutes. And so setting a shorter timeout, you know, is something that, that we all should be doing. Um, but then on top of that, right, how can, we, how can we detect that this is happening? How can we give this feedback to the customer? And how can we then maybe provide a mechanism to cancel this specific build, right? And this is, and, and you, might, you might ask, you know, why, is it, why isn't the customer canceling the build, right? Maybe the customer doesn't realize that this is happening. Uh, maybe it's running in CI somewhere, it's fully automated, right? They can't just SSH into the machine and touch it, right? And on our side, we can detect that it's happening and we can you know, provide the mechanism potentially to, to cancel this build. Um, so on top of the technical failures and process issues, there's also sort of these human factors, right? Humans make mistakes, and we need to plan for that, 
right? And there are different ways that we can plan for that. One is to introduce guardrails, right? A quota could be a guardrail in this case, where we say, well, this build isn't allowed to put like six and a half years of CPU time on the cluster. Um, but there is also, you know, in other cases, there might also be automation might be appropriate, right? You, you know, there is, a, for example, you have a release process. Uh, do you want the release process to be automatic or do you want it to be manual? Or do you want it to be semi-automatic, right? What's the best in the situation you're in? Um, and ideally, like, you don't want to automatically send out an update to every Windows machine on the planet. All right, let's, let's summarize. I'm, I, I'm surprised I have that much time left. The last time I held this talk, it was over 30 minutes. Um, so I have time for questions at the end. Um, this, is, this is, again, the incidents in chrono chronological order. So the first one was from 2020 uh, about flow control. Right? This is important for everyone working on remote execution services or like any other distributed ser service for that matter. Uh, make sure that you have flow control. The second one was the, the cyclic RPC calls, where the workers were calling each other and running into a deadlock. Um, again, you know, something that you can take away for any distributed system work. Um, then we had the slow GOMA builds, and here I wanted to focus on the uh, process issues, right? If you, if you run code in production, it's, you, you know, you should invest some time up front. I think you should. Uh, I think we should, right, as vendors, obviously, right? If we, if we run open source code in production, we need to go in, we need to spend some time to understand what the code does, how it works, and how best to monitor it. And also communicate very clearly, right? Provide a clear escalation path, provide a clear way for people to, to call you, like, and document that, right? Put it into one, you know, a place where people actually look uh, for that kind of information. And then the last one is, is a lot more difficult, right? Uh, how can you reliably distinguish between a client error like, and, a, and a server error, where the client is, especially for a remote execution API, right? It's literally remote execution as a service, right? Typically, remote execution is considered a security problem. Um, how can we distinguish cases where the client is working inside of the API and doing everything correctly, and where the client is maybe overloading the, the server or where the client is actually doing something uh, like security sensitive, right? Ideally, we can detect if a client is trying to uh, escape the sandboxing and you know, catch security issues that way. And so looking again at the like, sort of root causes that you can have, in my experience and in my opinion, it's never just a technical failure, right? Any time something goes wrong in your system, you know, there is this, something went wrong in production, how did that thing, how did that error make it into production, right? There are processes that we have in place before it goes into production. We have a design review, we have a code review, they didn't catch it, why didn't they catch it? Is there something that we can add here to catch these kind of issues, right? Can we add coverage to make sure that, well, maybe not make sure that it has tests, but at least create a strong incentive for our developers to, to write tests for, for all of the code paths that are there. And then when we consider not just technical failures and process failures, right, how can we design our systems to be resilient to people making mistakes? Or, or how can we automate some of those things, right? There's a trade-off here, right? When we automate, there isn't necessarily a person in the loop, but maybe you want a person in the loop, right? Is it, you know, what, to what extent do we need a person in the loop? All right, thank you all for listening. Um, if you want to see more content like this, please let me know. Uh, I think as a, you know, as a group and as a uh, technical people, we need to talk more about things that go wrong in our systems. And it is somewhat uncomfortable to stand up here and talk to you about all the things that we did wrong. Um, but I think it's still important and it's still something we can learn from each other. Um, so got my address here, talk to me after the talk. Uh, or if there are any questions, then Please, go ahead. Over your journey of uh, these many years with RB, what do you think is the one biggest thing can, that can impact the RB? Or what maintainers should look out while maintaining their repos that could 
have a great impact on RB. Uh, sorry, can you? I I didn't understand that. Can you say that again? What is one thing that maintainers should really keep an eye out? Uh, like Bazel code repo maintainers could keep an eye out that could really impact RBE for their uh, repositories. Um, so so we've we've seen a lot of people adopt Bazel, and one of the one of the problems that we've seen again and again is is rules that aren't aren't ready for remote execution. Um, and this is not an easy problem to solve, right? I'm not blame, again, postmortems, blameless postmortems, right? Um, <laughs> what can we do going forward to make it easier for rules authors to, to, to write their rules in a way that they're, they, they work great with remote execution? And I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't have a good answer here, but that's definitely one of the key items here. Um, I have kind of a technical question about the Flow, the lack of flow control incident. Um, in the case where it was pulling the data from upstream and buffering it eagerly uh, as much as it could, uh, why was there a reason why it was doing that in the first place? Why was it, rather than lazily pulling the data from upstream in response to more data being requested from downstream? Well, I mean, uh, <clears throat> the short answer is at the time we didn't realize that we were missing flow control. Um, but there, there are like different things you could do here, right? You could, um, for example, instead of having a long-running uh, call, you could download the file in, in, in chunks, right? And then you could only download like one chunk at a time to the API server, for example. Um, the other thing that I would like to point out, <clears throat> and I, again, I'm not trying to, to piss anyone off here, but the library that we're using in, in the documentation, it very clearly said, you know, all the flow control is automatic. Um, and it sort of forgot to point out that when you proxy, it's not automatic, but all the other cases are. Um, it's a little bit more, sorry, it's a little bit more complex than that, right? So the, the library that we're using, if you use it together, it's sort of designed for blocking calls. Uh, and if you use it together with async, like futures, whatever, um, then the flow control is no longer automatic. And then you have to go in and the APIs are really, really very solid that they provide. Um, but you have to actually go in and, and put extra care into implementing flow control correctly with those APIs. Thanks. But but certainly, you know, going forward, we have ways to deal with this, and we have in, actually we've built our own sort of infrastructure to make sure that we always have flow control on all of the long-running calls that we have. Um, to some extent, and I I was thinking of going into that detail, <laughs> um, but had to cut it because I thought it was over time. Um, so there is another case where you have actual remote execution. Um, so the client is calling the API server, the API server is calling the worker. We're running remote execution. Now we have flow control. Why does that matter? Well, when you have a long-running execute call, the, 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 the cluster can, can return updates, can say, yeah, I'm working on it, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Now, if you have a slow client and you have flow control connecting the client to the worker, now you're pushing back on the worker. You're actually making the worker slower. So if you naively implement flow control in this case, uh, you can actually end up hurting yourself because now you're, you're slowing down the worker. The worker is actually done with the work, but you're not, you know, you're not making it available again because the flow control is preventing you from doing that. Sorry, there's lots, lots of details here. <laughs> I, hope, I hope I answered your question. Um, Great, thanks. Any more last chance or talk to me afterwards? All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>